So I'm here with Glenn at the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex, and we're standing out in front of a very important radio receiver. Quite literally, history making, right Glenn? Yeah, this is Deep Space Station 46, so yep. sometimes known as the Honeysuckle Creek Dish. Okay. There were three tracking stations here in Canberra. All right. Our one here at Tippinbilla, one at a place called Aurora Valley, yep. and a third station, Honeysuckle. And Honeysuckle was built especially to support the Apollo missions to the moon. So this dish, its greatest claim in history is that it was the dish that originally received and broadcast to the entire world those first historic TV images of Neil Armstrong stepping onto the surface of the moon in July 1969. So, so what you're saying is when they were landing on the moon, the, that television radio waves frequency went through that receiver. Yeah, went right through this dish. A lot of people think, of course, because of a movie, that it was the dish at Parks that actually yep. did that. Parks came in a little bit later in the broadcast. Yep. The moon wasn't quite high enough in the local skies for them to get a clean signal back from the moon. But Honeysuckle, specifically designed to support the lunar missions, the moon was nice and high in our skies here in Canberra. And on that day, it received that beautiful image that was seen by the entire world. What I really love about that is the fact that we saw it live through Honeysuckle. We had to be rebroadcast to the other side of the planet. It means we saw the moon walk a third of a second before the rest of the world. Ah, so we, we had a, a sneak preview of history in the making before everyone else. We were first. We were first, that's right. And so, and this wasn't though here though, right? As you said, there were three stations built in Canberra um, for these networks. Yeah, so the Honeysuckle Creek Station was about 25 kilometres southwest of here yep. in what is today the Namaji National Park. And it operated between 1967 through to 1981. Okay. So after the end of the Apollo missions, in 1972, it was then used by the Deep Space Network to support a couple of the lunar missions yep. out there, more probes going off, and yeah. then some of the spacecraft off to Venus, some missions studying the sun. That's right. But at the end of that program, they decided to consolidate all of the tracking stations to here at Tibimbilla. Okay. So the Honeysuckle dish was dismantled. Yep. It was all part numbered, like a big kit. <laughs> okay. And then they took it apart, put it on trucks, shipped it down the road, and rebuild it right here. It then operated right through till 2010. Okay. And at the time of its retirement, it was the busiest single antenna in the deep space network, handling more individual spacecraft every day. And it was always the dish to acquire every spacecraft after it had launched, no matter where it had launched from in the world. Wow, so it's really uh, quite a claim to fame in terms of our uh, space exploration history, kind of just standing behind us. Yeah, and not only did it receive those words of one small step for man, it was also the antenna on point to collect the most, second most important words in space history, which were... Houston, we have had a problem. Had a problem. Uh, with the Apollo 13 mission, this antenna was vital in the first few hours of that great drama to get those astronauts back home again. So, so this was also supporting Apollo 13 during yeah, that time? Yeah, and handled yeah. every Apollo mission between 1969 and 1972, all 12 astronauts to walk on the moon. So this is, this is how, when we were exploring the moon in the early days, this is how all that data, all that signal came through, was these receivers exactly like the honeysuckle dish behind us. Yeah, but with technology, we're looking back over 50 years ago, we were practically still at the earliest types of transistors, capacitors, we we're almost still in the valves with some of the equipment that we were using. Everybody can Google what a valve yes. was <laughs> for spacecraft. And it was seat of your pants work. Nobody yeah. had ever done deep space communication for, let alone a mission with humans on the surface of another world. So everything was learnt along the way. So all the work we do today literally is built on the shoulders of those giants. Quite amazing. Yep. So I'm with Glenn and we're standing in front of the Honeysuckle Creek dish, which received those first images from Neil Armstrong and then eventually Buzz Aldrin landing on the moon. Uh, you know, we don't want to leave Buzz Aldrin out of the equation. Now, a lot has changed since then, both in the technology, but also what's happening with the moon race. So in a facility like the Deep Space Network uh, and the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex, how is this huge race now back to the moon changing or affecting what has to happen here? Yeah, a lot of people think we stopped exploring the moon after 1969, yeah. but we continued on and we never stopped going. We yep. continued to send robotic spacecraft missions to orbit around the moon, more probes landing on the surface right. and rovers driving around from multiple different nations. Today, the moon has even greater interest because it's really our stepping stone out into the rest of the solar system. Yep. If we're gonna learn how to live and work in space for longer periods of time, we need to get practice. Yep. We need to be able for close place like the moon, 
you know, a place with an aerosol environment, lower gravity, uh, well away from the Earth, but not too far away That's if you right. really That's need right. help before we take a journey a thousand times further away off to the same way like the planet Mars. Uh, we want to put more spacecraft in orbit around the Moon. Uh, we're now using the era of CubeSats yep. to be able to study the Moon in even greater detail, uh, single little missions uh, that can be done really quickly fast turnover, more and more exploration, uh, send more robotic probes down to the surface that will explore some of the craters at the South Pole, looking for resources that we can use like water before we eventually send humans back, maybe build a base of operations there, and then get that practice to eventually head off to Mars. And so how is the Deep Space Network going to play a role in that? What is it going to be needed for? Moon, it's deep space. It's well beyond the 100,000 kilometer yep. mark. So if you want to communicate with a spacecraft at the moon or beyond, you're going to use the DSN, the so, Deep Space Network. So now that we have all of these missions, not just happening, but planned, and I think every year we add in an extra 10 to 20 missions, it seems like, to the moon, this place is going to get quite busy just supporting the moon almost, right? Yeah, I mean, we're expecting with the big Artemis missions heading off to the moon, that first launch is carrying with it all the systems to help yep. us learn to send humans there on that first test, but it's carrying with it dozens oh, yeah. of little tiny spacecraft, those CubeSats. Yep. And that's just going to happen more and more and more. So we're going to have to have increased capacity. We're going to have to have more people doing more work over long periods of time. More science teams are going to place more demands on us. But that's the beauty of what we do. Mm. It's this big universe. We've got great engineers, and great technicians who will work through all of that, who will be able to work out ways that we can increase that capacity, maybe build some more antennas, move into higher frequencies. Yep. And right now, we're going to be moving from the era of a dish that's just doing radio waves into the era of dishes doing optical communications in the yep. future to do even more work. And so this is really going to be what the, the future is, I guess, for communications and space is as we do more in space, we're going to have to get, as you said, smarter, more efficient, but just plainly do more. And it's not going to be done with some of those small antennas that we think with some of those satellites near the Earth. It has to happen with facilities like this because it's just simply, even though the moon is nearby in terms of a, the, the universe, it's still pretty far away for everything else. It is, and we literally have a saying in the Deep Space Network, don't leave Earth without us. <laughs> I think that's a great message to think about to end on when we talk about how do we communicate in space. Glenn, thanks for having us. Thanks very much, Brad.